Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome back, everyone. My name is Navi Raju. I'm the Exec Director of the Center for Indian Global Business at University of Cambridge. It's my true pleasure to moderate this next panel on innovations. Actually, I should correct myself on innovations. Uh, it's kind of interesting because on Sunday uh, evening, uh, Raghuram Raj and was saying that you know India stopped contributing new knowledge to the world since uh, World War II, or I should say since independence. And uh, I'm not really sure about it because today actually we are adding a new word to the English dictionary, innovations. So what exactly is innovations? Well, innovations is of course innovations made in India. These innovations are driven both by multinationals but also domestic companies. They're driven by large companies as well as grassroots entrepreneurs. Now, Indian innovations, I would argue, actually fall into five broad categories. The first one is, of course, science and technology innovations that catches the media uh, you know, headlines that include things like the moon mission by ISRO. And then you have business innovations that include new products and business models like the nano by Tata. Then you have social innovations that includes innovations led by grassroots entrepreneurs like the three social entrepreneurs who were awarded here yesterday. And then the area of energy and environment, you have innovation led by companies like Suzlon or Reva, which makes electric cars. And then finally, the fifth category, you have art and culture innovations. That might be Manish Arora taking, for example, his fashion designs abroad, or Hollywood studios coming to India to do animation work. But in our session today, for the sake of time, we are going to actually focus on science and technology innovation, business innovation, but most importantly, on social innovation as well. The kind of question we'll be addressing in the panel today would be, who will be developing these so-called innovations? What raw ingredients it will take to cook up and develop these innovations? And then most importantly, a subject we don't often talk about, who will be actually using these innovations? In particular, we'll be looking at the ways to strengthen the supply side and the demand side factors to make India a global innovation hub. And without delay, let me begin by introducing the panelists here uh, on stage. I'm very pleased to have a special guest today, Mr. Sam Petroda, who's sitting on the fourth from your left. Um, Sam, of course, needs no introduction. He's the architect of the telecom revolution. I can see many people, Sam, are already you know, cheerleading you, uh, including myself, except my hands are tied. Um, so, of course, uh, Sam needs no introduction, and currently, um, more recently, he was the chairman of the Nal National Knowledge Commission, and now is advisor to Prime Minister on public information infrastructure, and excitingly, on innovations as well. And then, immediately to my right is uh, Ken Jester, who is the EVP of Law, Policy, and Corporate Strategy at Salesforce.com, a U.S. tech company, and a world leader in cloud computing. And Ken has uh, already excused himself because he has to leave a little bit early around 4.30. Um, and then sitting uh, next to him is uh, Mr. Hari Bhatia, the co-chairman and MD of Jubilant Organisys India, as also the vice chairman of the CII. And then immediately to the right of Mr. Sam Petroda is, of course, Sam Mittal, president of NASCOM. And to his right is Mr. Ravi Pandit, Chairman and Group CEO of KPIT Cummins Infosystems in India. And then finally, last but not least, we have a young Turk, I guess, uh, Sachin uh, Dugal, uh, President and CEO of a startup called Nivio, which is based in Switzerland. And uh, I heard Sachin talk two weeks ago in London at the Economist Innovation Conference, and I'm sure he has some fascinating uh, viewpoints to offer to us. I want to actually begin with Sam with a kind of a broad qu question which is related to uh, you know, your new role, Sam. I noticed that you have the term innovations in your title, which are we all like, uh, but can you describe us a little bit more about your new responsibilities and what kind of top priorities you have in mind for innovation in this country? In her last major speech, talked about decade of innovation in India. We have gone through a significant developmental phase in the last 20, 25 years with one focus on ICT and two focus on liberalization, privatization, government reforms to some extent, economic reforms. We believe now we need to essentially focus on human capital, and as a result, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh 
set up a national knowledge commission to prepare a blueprint for knowledge institutions and infrastructures India would need in the 21st century. And now, precedents call for a decade of innovations. Innovations which are focused more on social and inclusive innovations. Our focus right now is to really make sure that the people at the bottom of the pyramid are part of the growth and prosperity. And as a result, we want to use information infrastructure that we have already in place with hundreds of thousands of kilometers of optical fiber, all kinds of software capabilities, computing, to make sure that these things do affect the lives of the poorest of the poor. So the role of IT then is seen in a very different light in governance as well as delivering public services. At the National Knowledge Commission, we focused on five aspects of knowledge. Access to knowledge, which include languages, translations, libraries, portals, broadband connectivity, affirmative action programs, reservations, quotas, and then all knowledge concepts related to school education, vocational education, higher education, distance learning, open courseware, teachers training, so and so forth. We also looked at the idea of creating knowledge. Who creates knowledge? How knowledge is created? Patents, copyright, trademarks, innovations, entrepreneurships. Application of knowledge in agriculture, health, small and medium scale industries. And finally, e-governance to focus on knowledge to improve governance. So we see this as part of a continuing process. Telecom, knowledge, innovation. We think we have a great window of opportunity in the next five, 10 years to make a significant dent if we focus on social and inclusive innovations. We already have a lot of efforts going on at national level, in our laboratories, in our companies. We believe people, culture, diversity, and needs drive innovations more so than markets and globally competitive economy. It's a whole different way of looking at innovations. I have some strange views on it. For example, I believe best brains in the world have been busy solving problems of the rich who really don't have problems to solve. As a result, problems of the poor really don't get the kind of talent it deserves. Problems of the poor are very complex, require different business model, different approach. We had an opportunity to tackle on some of these in early 80s when we came up with the idea of STD PCOs. The idea was to focus on access to telecom as opposed to improving telephone density. No one really understood some of it then. We believe there are opportunities like this in many areas at this point in time. Having tea earlier there in the room, I mentioned to our moderator that we are looking at, for example, 30 million court cases that we have and we take 15 years to settle a court case in this country on an average. We want to use IT to reduce time to justice from 15 years to two years now. And we believe we can do it. We have started the process. Similarly, we are building a national knowledge network to connect 5,000 nodes using 10 gigabit facility to connect all our universities, all our R&D institutions, all our agricultural research, health research, to really improve collaboration. We have a program where we pay poor people with 100 days of work per year, program called NREGA, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. 
and we want to use IT there to improve productivity, efficiency, accounting, reduce leakage, corruption, to make sure that the poor people get paid on time. Lot of this requires whole different focus on innovation. We need to focus on access, affordability, scalability, sustainability. We want regional innovations which are scalable. We want national, international collaboration, but we really want to create a whole new model. It is not about fancy gadgets and products to be competitive in the international market. It is really about looking at our needs and trying to address these needs. We also want to look at a completely new business model. I believe the US-based consumption model is not scalable, workable, or sustainable. We need a whole new model of development, and I believe India can probably evolve. We still don't know what that is. But we do have human talent to address the problems of the poor, not only for India, but for many other poor all over the world. As you know, we have 550 million young below age of 25. We have the workforce for the world. However, we need to train them. So it is not just about higher education. It is also about vocational education. It is about school education. But then we need a new model of learning. The earlier model which says duster, blackboard, chalk, teacher, textbook, homework, exam, grades, certificate, is not workable. So we want to use technology in education and health to really create new opportunities in a big way. And I see that as my challenge going forward in the next five years to come. I hope that gives you a little clue. Thank you. That's uh, very interesting. Um, I also uh, learned a new term, time to justice, which I really like. I think it's a concept that hopefully we'll hear more and more. Um, uh, my next question is actually to Mr. Som Mittal. Som, actually when it comes to innovation happening in India, I mean the first industry people think about is the IT industry, right? A lot of people think the IT industry is doing a lot of innovative work for multinational companies. But if you look at the kind of balance sheet, a lot of these companies, IT providers, the bulk of what they do tends to be software development or application kind of, you know, implementation kind of services, which is really not, I claim, kind of innovative work. So what's the strategy from NASCOM perspective to kind of get these Indian IT providers move up the so-called innovation ladder? Let's be clear, I think this industry is about 10 years old, really, in terms of size. It was about $2 billion 10 years back. It's grown in this last 10 years. But I think it's wrong to say that it's only software. Actually, today it's moved on to be doing uh, a lot of work around infrastructure, design, PTO. Uh, there is a fair amount of work happening in engineering and design. Uh, it may, the IT may not be owned by India, but there is a lot of work that's happening where end-to-end -end products getting developed here. I think if there was one area of innovation that's happened and happened well, it's about process innovation. Because to do all this work, right, it may not be the next uh, rocket science, but I think there is a rocket science involved in taking a process and improving it so that you can do it faster, cheaper, and, and better. But uh, having said that, uh, I think there are movements already happening. I think the, uh, if you look at it, the number of outcome-based deals that come in. That means it's not about saying how many people you have and what you pay, but it's really success-based. So that, I think, drives innovation anyway. It's fixed price contracts because now you are incentivated to do it differently and better. Uh, the, the issue, I think, really is that it's okay to have technology expertise, but it's domain expertise because you must know not only your customer's business, but what their customer's customers do. And I think that's where I think more work is required by the companies. And that really goes back to what Sam said. This is for international clients. If you look at domestic uh, business here, I think uh, the role of IT in any innovation, and that's why IT keeps mention, mentioned, because I don't think we can reach education, healthcare, and all the other stuff that we want are part of inclusive growth without use of technology. So I think that's, that's fundamental. What was holding it back till now? I, I think uh, with the great work that happened 
in the past when telecom today connectivity is there, but it still needs to reach to a larger, but it will happen. The cost was very high. Mind you, the cost of IT continues to be because it's largely dollar denominated at least in hardware, right? And continues to be high, but thank God again for technologies like cloud computing and SaaS, where I think it'll be coming to a shared services model. So I, I would believe that in this coming years, you should see that movement. And like you said, the next five years are very exciting. I think it should happen in the next five, otherwise you would have missed this bus. And I think it's gonna be very expensive because I think aspiration levels of all those people whom we talk about including in this growth has gone up. So uh, very briefly, I think we, if I would have to say while innovation is required because actually there are lots of young people doing lots of good stuff, they have developed, we have to change those pilots into scale that Sam spoke about. So I think there is already solutions available. We just need to take them to scale and execute on them, right? And uh, do that fast. The other thing I, I believe is changing and will change more is that everything that we talk about innovation, particularly in our, in our context, should be uh, the acceptance by our society for failure. Because when you do innovation, there'll be two successes out of 10, eight may fail or maybe average. And I think the society should accept that. And I think you're finding that through funding models and so on, I think that's getting acceptance. So, uh, while we look at the past, let's look at the future. I think we have all the ingredients. We just need to execute and make it happen. Promoting a culture of innovation, as you said, is definitely important. And I think building on that, Ken, I mean, you kind of look at the IT industry from a US perspective, your operations, you know, in India as well. So what would be your take on having, you know, interact with other innovation hotbeds around the world? What are the steps that you think that, for example, the knowledge industry here, like the IT industry should take to kind of move up the ladder? Well, as been, has been said, I think the Indian information technology industry has been a key driver in a lot of the uh, positive things that have occurred in India and has been an innovator, but it really needs to keep going uh, to stay ahead of the game. And in technology, every 10 or 20 years, there's a major development that really changes the way we do business. And that latest development has been the internet and the power that the internet can bring to bear in a whole range of applications and it has now developed something called cloud computing where you can access information technology data and resources over the internet to do your computing and I think this holds tremendous promise for Indian entrepreneurs and for social uh, and developmental progress in India overall as the internet becomes faster more powerful IT functions can be performed remotely over the internet in large shared data centers rather than on locally managed servers. And this is important for a variety of reasons and is really leading to a paradigm shift in the information technology industry. First, uh, and this really gets back to what Sam was saying, is that with cloud computing, you don't need the resources to make the enormous investment in IT infrastructure and hardware and software in order to get the benefit of computing power. You can tap into it over the internet. You don't need to manage your own information infrastructure with all the headaches and complexity that goes into that. You can use computing power as you need it, the same way you use power up for a utility. So you don't have to build up a lot of capacity. You can scale up and scale down as necessary. It's really more secure and reliable to use information technology over the internet because you're relying on companies that are using state-of-the-art equipment and have the top flight personnel. And most importantly, cloud computing is environmentally sensitive because rather than every organization or individual having to have its own information technology infrastructure and hardware, you really just have one data center that is much more efficient overall. So this really opens up an enormous opportunity for the Indian IT sector, not just for building large data centers that some of the large companies might be doing uh, and that you see, let's say, an Amazon doing in the United States, but also for the entrepreneur who wants to provide value-added services and software applications. So for Indian IT companies and people involved in the IT industry, they have a number of opportunities to really be innovating with cloud computing. First, you're already seeing some of the large companies such as Wipro and Infosys and TCS providing consulting services for clients that want to adopt cloud computing or integrate their existing systems into cloud computing services. 
you also have some of these large news investing in infrastructure so they themselves can be cloud computing data centers. I know Wipro has announced a data center in Mysore. But what I think is most exciting and a tremendous opportunity is for smaller Indian IT companies and entrepreneurs to be providing the value-added services and software that can really unleash a whole new generation of opportunity. Uh, we've seen it in simple ways with two brothers from Calcutta who developed the Scrabulous game on the Facebook infrastructure. But we can also see the use of cloud computing and software applications over the internet for business enterprises. You have companies in India such as Zoho, which makes a whole range of productivity applications and customer relationship management, or DimDim that has devised ways to collaborate over the internet with web conferencing and other opportunities. But what really I want to highlight is the opportunity to use cloud computing for social and economic development. I had lunch today with a company named Jana Lakshmi, which is using cloud computing for microfinance, and it's getting into rural parts of India. And in microfinance, uh, it's really very costly for individuals to be making, uh, or for a microfinance institution to be making lots of these small loans to individuals. But suddenly, if you have access to computing power, it can lower the cost of managing a huge portfolio of loans, of keeping track of screening applications, tracking your loans, monitoring payments, following up on problems, uh, enables the uh, agency that's overseeing all this to see across their whole port portfolio. And I think you can really use cloud computing to advance social development in rural areas with microfinance in the health for healthcare applications, for educational applications, for even things such as disaster recovery, again, at a much lower cost and able to reach populations that wouldn't themselves be able to benefit from computing power because they wouldn't have the wherewithal to invest in the infrastructure. So just to summarize, I think the power of the internet and of the new cloud computing model offers tremendous opportunities for Indian uh, high-tech individuals and entrepreneurs to really lead the way uh, in this next generation of information technology. Fascinating. So I think to summarize, I think as you said, so cloud company could be an enabler both on the supply side but also on the demand side. Absolutely. Interesting. Actually, talking about cloud computing, we have another player on panel here, actually. Um, I'm referring to Sashin Dugal, CEO of the Nivio. Sashin, you actually run this uh, very interesting startup, actually, which is also in the cloud computing space. And uh, you, interestingly, from what I understand, your company has R&D operations not only here in, in India, but also in Sydney, I believe, right? And then in New York as well. So what made you pick you know, India over other countries when it came to, you know, locating our R&D work here? So, uh, you know, I think um, what's interesting for us I in the Indian ecosystem was the ready available um, quality talent. But it's not been an easy journey. Um, you know, and, and for some of the reasons that my distinguished panelists have mentioned. Um, for one, in India, failure is a black mark. In Silicon Valley, failure is your second degree. Um, for a second, um, the ecosystem is around entrepreneurs that are big on price arbitrage, not so big on solving big problems. Um, and that's a fundamental issue. Um, and, and finally, I think, you know, touching on innovation, and, and then I'll come, come back a little bit more to the, to the point. Um, we often treat innovation and corporate social responsibility as the tie and the lapel on a suit. Fundamentally, innovation should be the suit we wear and corporate social responsibility the fabric of the suit not separated. Um, the reason we chose India was not because of price arbitrage, but because we felt that we could solve a problem here. Saurabh and I had a dream from five years ago where the idea was how could we educate 100 million kids before we die? A profound dream, one at three in the morning. But we realized that we do this through technology. The idea of connecting the unconnected, the idea of providing education to the masses and the underprivileged. But at the same time, because cloud makes a social change, we were also able to use the same thing to apply to small businesses in India, to offer them the benefit of cloud so that they don't have to worry about infrastructure issues, desktop management, but more importantly, to solve emerging markets issues like piracy. Why does it exist? It exists because for a very simple imbalance. Today, everybody wants to be legal. No one wants and goes out into the world and saying, well, I'm gonna do the wrong thing. But at a certain point, there is an imbalance between the cost of being legal and the act of being legal. And what you're seeing is when 
the a traditional method of pricing where you know licensed software exceeded 15,000 rupees for a disk, the cost of being legal far uh, exceeded um, the, uh, the the right to be to be good. Um, and so what we're doing is the idea of kind of breaking down the software license. So you rent applications, you rent infrastructure, and you're away with, with PCs. And I think that's how you're going to make social change in, in the wider spread parts of India and emerging markets. Fascinating. Reducing the cost of adopting innovation, that's a very interesting, noble mission as well. Uh, Ravi, I want to come to you because oftentimes um, I think that when we think about, you know, Indian IT as it, I think it's Tom was talking about, we talk about the kind of low-end kind of services, but you embody actually a new business model, which I think you may want to share with the audience, which is to kind of provide high-end R&D services to multinationals. So can you comment on your business model, but also talk about why you're confident that India has the kind of R&D kind of strengths in the right place to make become a global innovation hub? See, I think when we talk about R&D services to uh, multinationals, uh, I think we need to make a distinction here. And I go back to what Sam was saying earlier. You know, it's not necessarily R&D for someone else. I think our industry can now also do R&D for ourselves, for our markets, or maybe for global markets. So you had a situation at some point in time in the evolution of our industry uh, where the IT industry was essentially doing R&D for somebody else. So we would typically do... Uh, you know, maybe um, a software development for a client in the US, and we will bring innovation in the process of doing it, or we'll bring innovation in the way in which we collect knowledge assets while we do the delivery, et cetera. But now we see that there is a change, and there are companies, and like companies like us, who are looking at R&D full stop. Like, we will do R&D which we can bring to the world. And, and I think that's a change. And, and I think that change is happening when there are companies who are looking at not R and uh, not IT services in general, but we are companies looking at IT services for a particular application. And let me give an illustration. We work in the area of mobility industry. Work mostly with automotives. Uh, that is like movement of goods and people. Now that's really like uh, the blood flowing in your body. You know, it's very very critical. How can we come out with better solutions for mobility? How can we come out with cars which consume less gasoline, bring out less emissions, are safer? And all of that involves a lot of software. You know, progressively, even smaller cars are having better, you know, higher degree of electronics. So providing that is a solution, uh, providing better embedded software in automotives is a solution which is applicable to this market as it can be applicable globally. Can we come out with cars which are hybrid cars with better electronics in it? Can we come out with cars which are safer so less people die on account of accidents? Now those are the kind of R&D areas which are coming up. And I think these are areas you mentioned, you began the session by talking about innovations. These are the kind of innovations which can come out of this market. Because I think we have an ability to look at low cost solutions. We can go to the core of a problem and take out all the frills and uh, we can come out with a solution which is applicable not only to the emerging market, but now progressively to the developed market where there is a whole segment of people who can't afford to have all those high-end things that were there earlier. Let me give you an example. We work, uh, now we have put together a consortium with Government of India with major OEMs and tier ones in the country which manufacture automobiles for coming out with a standard of electronic interfaces inside a car which are focused for the small car. So like, you know, there is a European standard for Autosar, there is a Japanese standard called Jaspar, but they typically deal with high-end cars who have maybe 90 to 110 ECUs. There are a lot of small-end cars, A and B class cars, who have maybe 15 ECUs. They need a much smaller standard. If we come out with such a standard, it's a standard for the globe, not just for India, and it's a standard which can be made, which can make the electronics extremely light. So this is our R&D contribution to the world to solving of our problem. And I think there is a phenomenal potential available now. I think we have to change the perspective of the Indian IT industry as a services industry. There are many of us who are maturing to the next level of innovation where we are actually solving problems which are of relevance to us. Very uh, pertinent because I think what you're saying is also the ability of the IT industry to generate unique IP. Because that has been a major concern for you know the IT industry is whether it's just 
being named as a cyber coolies, you know, kind of just executing orders for Western clients as opposed to inventing new stuff that you can patent. The second point you're making is very interesting because uh, one of our colleagues in Cambridge University has looked at the fact that in the West, there's an obsession with adding more electronics in cars. But the reverse kind of, or kind of the, the, the perverse effect of that, the cars are getting heavier and therefore consume more energy. <laughs> so you may make build smarter cars, but not necessarily you know, sustainable cars. So I think you're actually doing a good service for the world as well. That's fantastic. Uh, Harry, I want to come to you now because you kind of uh, wanted to exhaust the topic of IT because that's kind of where India got into the world map. But um, I was in France recently uh, and I was taking a train to come to London and the customs officer kind of looked at my passport, which is a French passport, and then I s looked, I was born in India, and he said, oh, you are from India. And I said, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you guys are doing amazing work in you know, biotech. I said, wow, that's very interesting. I said, how do you know that? Well, there was a documentary yesterday on a French TV talking about you know, the growth of life sciences. So you are actually running a life science company out of uh, India. And life sciences is seen as a kind of the next big thing coming out of India. Um, can you comment on the potential of this industry to kind of, you know, uh, become, uh, you know, major leader in the global knowledge space? With the background knowledge that we have is that the local pharma sector has been good at reverse engineering and kind of, you know, doing generics kind of thing. But what will it take for the pharma industry, like the IT industry we talked about, to come up with some kind of unique IT that it can monetize and, you know, move up the va value ladder? Sure. Uh, let me first talk a little bit about the context of of how innovation does happen, and I'll relate it to the life science industry. Uh, you, what you need is a is a very demanding customer, or you need a problem to solve, or you need customers who want lower and lower prices. So I think if you really see the way pharmaceutical industry developed in India, was at a time when uh, people could not afford drugs unless it was brought down to a very low cost. That's how the Indian pharmaceutical industry evolved, manufacturing generic drugs. You may call it process, copying the process of an existing innovative drug and bringing it to the market. But there were a lot of incremental innovations that were done that brought the cost down to such a low level that today, if you compare even a generic drug which goes to US in a highly regulated market or the European market and see the price of the drug in India, it would be one-tenth the price. I'm not comparing it with the, with the branded innovative drug. And what Indian industry did, this learning, then they applied to export generic drugs. And today, if a generic, if an innovative drug goes off patent, the day it goes off patent, the price of the drug comes down to as low as two to three percent. So you can imagine the industry that is making a contribution. So the highest number of FDA approved facilities are today in India. Now, and this happened through a stream of innovations. Now I will come to how the, the industry is starting to move from generic drugs to innovative drugs. You know, in the early 90s when India opened up, we, of course, were open to competition, and uh, that was the first change of mindset. Because I believe there are two things which you need for really doing game-changing innovation, is you need a mindset, and you need an entrepreneur with a vision, and who is not scared of failure, as, as you rightly said. So um, the, you, you talked about failure. So what we started to see, companies who had evolved from the generic side, learned the regulated pharmaceutical industry said, why can't we make our own drug? And I think it's just a mindset change. It's not that they did not know how to do it even 25 years back. So today you have a stream of industries. And I would further add that we also developed an ecosystem because innovation really cannot happen on alone. You know, you can't just say, today I'm going to be very innovative. You need an ecosystem. You need academia. You need institutions which provide you high quality human resource. You need risk capital. Somebody who will say, I'm going to take that risk. You need vendors who support what the infrastructure that you need. 
we need a high quality research infrastructure. I think India has that today. You have what you call innovation clusters now, which, which work together to bring out what you call new drugs. Now, in the, in the life science industry, when you, when you come out with new drugs, you can do it for others, but there is an advantage. You can out-license it. So you may not be the owner of 100% of that drug, but if you have that drug, like you say, Intel Insight, you know, so you will have, even if you develop your drug, you out-license it to somebody, he then takes it to the market, you still have a large part, portion of that final market value coming back to you because you have a share in royalties. So I think what is ha starting to happen in India is the ind industry has developed different models of innovation from contract research to partnerships to out licensing. And I think these are steps of learning. The question will be, will we have an Indian drug in the market? I think yes, very soon because it takes 10 years to, to, to launch an Indian drug. I think in the next five years you will see Indian drugs invented in India in the global market, not only serving the global community, but also serving the Indian community. So I, I think the, the life science industry in India has really come to a stage where we can say that we can look at breakthrough innovations. You, we talked about IT, you know, bioinformatics will play a huge role. The genomic database, how do you do structure-based drug design? IT is an important component of it. So what Indian companies are starting to do is to combine IT using genomic database, structure-based drug design to really compress the time. So today, I think what we are bringing to the world is affordable innovation. Because we live, live in a constrained environment, so we learn to do things A faster and maybe at a lower cost. So I think, I think that's where I see the industry going. Uh, and I see new drugs coming out at one fourth the cost than what globally it used to come, probably a billion dollar a drug. To create more value for less cost for more people. That's very interesting. Um, I want to switch gear and a little bit start talking a little bit some of the challenges as well that I think um, this is all good news and uh, at the same time, let's also face the reality, right? I mean, if you look at some of the research that we have done at uh, Cambridge University, uh, the main reason a multinational locates an R&D center in any country, whether India or China, is not cost or access to markets, like China may want us to believe, but rather the quality of its talent. So my next question is actually to Sam. Um, Sam, you actually chair the National Audit Commission, and you know the reality is that I think MIT alone graduates more PhD in computer science than the entire country here in India. So what steps do you think the government should take to actually make up for this you know, high-end kind of talent shortage or talent shortage period? Well, as part of the National Knowledge Commission, we recommended to the government that one, we should increase number of universities from 400 to 1,500. We want expansion, so more universities, more colleges. We want excellence to make sure that the quality of our education changes substantially. Because leaving aside first five, ten percent of the universities, ninety percent don't produce good quality students. And the third is access. We want to make sure that the poorest of the poor can indeed get the best education possible in this country. As a result of all of this and the demand from the industry, Government of India has decided to spend $67.5 billion on education in the 11th plan, which is five times more than the 10th plan. So the next five years are all about education, education, education. We recognize that without good focus on human resource development, we cannot meet our growth. So we need people not only at PhD level, but we also need more plumbers, electricians, welders, carpenters, bus drivers, truck drivers, 
and the list goes on and on. So vocational education and higher education are key priorities along with school education. But we also recognize that we cannot improve quality and expand our base without use of IT, new technology. And that's the reason we want to build a massive national knowledge network at the cost of something like $2 billion. We've already started building it. Part of it is operational. President of India inaugurated national knowledge network in April of this year. And the idea is to connect all our universities with 10 gigabit bandwidth. So a professor from IIT in Chennai doesn't need to talk to only 50 students in his or her class, but can be seen by 5,000 colleges in the country. And this is already happening. So we are very conscious. These things take time. There are no quick fixes. We have learned that. Telecom took us 20 years. So what we are starting today in knowledge will take us 20 years. So don't expect quick fixes. It's a process that we are putting in place. And don't expect product out of that process overnight. Thank you. Great. Um, actually, my next question actually is building uh, um, Sam's point on quality. This is actually to uh, Mr. Somital. Is actually, I read recently that NASCOM came up with a statistic that 75% uh, of the graduates that were, you know, interviewed by IT companies in this country were found to be unemployable. So clearly, on the one hand, we talk about the IT industry moving up the ladder. On the other hand, you know, I think Sashin hinted that as well, that there are the soft skills and other type of skills that the new fresh graduates are, you know, lacking. So what steps you, uh, NASCOM is taking to kind of redress the situation? We all know that course curriculum. So let's first face it, I think, and Sam alluded to that. I think we have some huge problems in the way things got structured or practices came in. I think it's very difficult. Uh, when I passed out, uh, my salary was one fourth that of a professor, right? Today, the salary of the guy who passes out is two times that of a professor. So who wants to be a professor, right? So I think we have, in some manners, our faculty uh, is lacking there. The motivation is lacking. And I think what we are producing are eminently bright people who are trainable. But I think that's a huge cost the industry pays. I think we spent in our industry alone a couple of billion dollars in unlearning and learning. So why do we have to have 30 weeks of programs in the IT campuses to bring them to speed and then put them as shadows, whereas anywhere else in the world, I think in two weeks, they're productive. So uh, I think the curriculums are available. The Knowledge Commission has listed out 150 recommendations. I don't think we need any more ideas. All the ideas that we need are there, and we just need to execute it. And I believe that with all the statements that uh, Mr. Kapil Sibyl, with you know his passion for it, and have, I think these three, four years, if we didn't change, make the change, I think we'll have lost it. In the same time, I don't think we need to give up on what we are doing. I think we should continue to reskill and train people, whatever be the cost. And I hope, I'm not sure what to call it, but what we call finishing schools and other things that are outside college, right, and in between the college and the uh, industry should get set up, whether they are for vocational training or for specialization. And I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that would happen. And you know, the fact that we are going to open ourselves for foreign universities, and we have no choice. Right. And the aspiration levels have been raised. And there are at the same time some very good examples. In, in Andhra Pradesh, there is a university which has been set up, which takes only people from the rural areas. It's not a four-year engineering program, it's a six-year because they take people from the 10th standard onwards, and instead of these two years that people waste, they actually take them into a residential place. Now they have the third year running with 6,000 residential colleges. So I think there is an innovation happening in education for others to emulate. Fascinating. Assuming that actually we increase the quantity, my next question actually to Ken um, is, even if you in to increase the quantity of professors and you know the output and the quality of students, et cetera, one of the differentiating factors of the United States is that there's this kind of strong linkage between university and industry, right? So that means that there's an ability for the kind of um, inventions developed in the academic lab or in national lab to find its way into the industry. 
and the growth of any economy is in converting that kind of scientific knowledge into you know business and societal applications and in the United States we have something called the Baydol Act which facilitates this kind of tech transfer between you know uh, the industry uh, the, sorry the university and industry uh, you are a lawyer by training so I, mean, I guess my question to you is uh, what kind of legal regime or legal framework you think is required here to kind of accelerate this kind of knowledge transfer between the kind of the uh, industry university side of the, state, the world and then the industry side of the world no i'm not as familiar with the legal framework that you might need i think in part of part of it may go to the mindset which was referred to earlier uh, and if i can get back to the opportunity for example that a cloud computing provides it allows individuals not to have to seek jobs with big companies uh, or to raise lots of capital to be innovators but really to already have an infrastructure out there and it's just to have ideas and the courage to go out and build an application and take uh, the risk of uh, being out there on their own and innovating. And that may be a mindset change. I'm not sure it's as much uh, a legal regime as the way you approach things. Uh, but some of the challenges that are also provided, uh, first of all, uh, and we've talked about the role that IT can play in a lot of the enablers for educational and uh, health care reform and, and uh, opportunity is, in my opinion, to increase internet penetration uh, throughout the country. Uh, it's really a fraction of what it should be overall relative to mobile telephones. It's still only a fraction. And uh, now that you can tap into huge computing power over the internet, if we could just increase connectivity and penetration, there are huge opportunities uh, for individuals. Another challenge is, uh, again, uh, it's a different business model uh, if you're providing services over the internet. Rather than making sales and, and uh, getting large payments, you're providing a continual uh, service month by month. Now, I think in many respects, Indian IT industry members should have an advantage there because they do have a service ethos and while that's often been done in the back office they really now need to just transfer that to the to the front office uh, and a final challenge uh, relates to the technology model uh, much of traditional technology involves using uh, individual uh, computer models uh, that are dedicated for a particular company or a particular project and this new cloud computing model is what's called a multi-tenant model where everyone is on the same data system though in their own secure uh, compartment and it's really a different way of thinking about uh, technology uh, and not to get too technical but a way that can be much more efficient and much more effective once people get over the psychological hurdle of not worrying about having their own dedicated infrastructure but one that's actually shared among thousands of users. So clearly that could help uh, reduce the cost of launching new startups. That makes a lot of sense. However, I think when it comes to on the topic of entrepreneurship that you're referring to, even if you have the mindset shift, it still needs, I guess, regulatory kind of change. And my next question actually is to Sam. Sam, yesterday we had a workshop here on the topic of entrepreneurship. And uh, people are asked to list some of the kind of uh, still kind of hurdles that entrepreneurs have to kind of overcome in order to be successful in this country. And there were a bunch of you know factors listed. But two, I can single out one was the days it take to launch a business in this country, which may take months compared to in China or in the United States, of course. And the second one was uh, restrictive labor laws was cited, as well as access to capital. Um, so what do you think policymakers should do to kind of remove these hurdles so that Prime Minister Manmohan Singh referred to this animal spirit of entrepreneurs in India? How do they unleash that? I think we recognize that at this stage, in the development in this country, we do need reforms in the government. We need deregulation in many sectors, further deregulation. We need to privatize some of our industries. And we need to really streamline processes. The biggest challenge in front of us, from my perspective, is to re-engineer government processes. Everything we do today, not only in India, but perhaps all over the world, is based on 19th century mindset, 20th century process, 21st century needs. 
We need to change our processes. How do we get birth certificate? How do we get land record? How do we apply for admission in school? I find that all these processes need to be redesigned. They're all obsolete. No wonder it takes long time to get anything done everywhere. I mean, in India, we are famous for this Nadawali file, the file with a you know, leather or not leather, you sort of a, a string. Yeah? And one of my goals is to say, can we get rid of the Nadawali file and someday start filing in electronic system? We have software, we have capabilities, we have security, but we don't have the mindset to do it. So you go to any minister's office, you have, you know, stack full of files. And that shows the mindset. So I do agree that we have a long way to go in redesigning our processes to reflect the realities of the 21st century. Fascinating. So I want to kind of ask a question to an uh, actual entrepreneur. Uh, Take sure, one more, please, if please. you don't mind. I forgot to mention one thing, that we are in the process of building 14 new innovations universities. These are unique, different, and our goal is to build each university with a different model altogether. Because we believe the university of 2050 is going to be very different from the university of today. All the universities today are based on the model that was designed maybe 200 years ago. Who really decided that it should take four years to get a BS? The whole world follows it. Who said it should take two years to get a master's? Why so many credits? Why all these vertical silos? So we have decided to build 14 new innovation universities. Each one is going to be very different from the other one in concept, idea, approach, processes, procedure. And I think out of these 14, we will learn a great deal as to what the university of future should look like. We were the pioneers in building universities for the world. 2,700 years ago, we built Nalanda, Takshashila. We lost that tradition in the process, and we think we have a lot to contribute. So that's our goal. Fascinating. Actually, our uh, Amartya Sen famously said that uh, when Cambridge was set up 800 years ago, that was actually when Nalanda actually, you know, was the fall of Nalanda. So the cycle repeats itself. Um, actually, my next question is um, to Sashin. I mean, you are actually a real entrepreneur uh, who has actually done things uh, in the space. And uh, interestingly, you launched your company out of Switzerland. So my question to you, why not launch it here? What are the kind of challenges that would have prevented you from launching it here? So I think, you know, um, I'd start off by saying that I'm a patriot. Um, I, I really believe it in the future, but I'm also a realist. Um, we have some very interesting dichotomies in this country. We, um, we talk about fostering innovation and entrepreneurship and young business. Yet how many government projects actually embrace startups? We talk about wanting to build colleges and establishments and networks and knowledge societies. When have we gone to the core source of where innovation really happened? In that garage where Infosys was created when it was a small company in the startups that exist, that are fighting for capital, that are fighting for visibility. Because ultimately, if you think about the companies that survive in India, a large portion of their revenue comes from the government, yet there's no embracing mechanism. Um, then you have the issues of um, red tapism. Um, it's often very difficult to operate um, within the social fabric um, or even the legal framework that exists for a young company. Um, we chose Switzerland. For, for a couple of reasons, one being that it gave us European access. Um, it gave us a solid brand of good corporate governance. Um, but also, we, but from one, th one thing that's really worth noting is, whatever we have ever launched, whether it was um, the world's first online Windows desktop, or whether it was the first indigenous storage, online storage, or whether it was the $50 computer that launches with, with Bharti this month, we've launched it first in India. Um, we've not launched it in Europe or anywhere else in the world. So, we believe in that concept of for India by India. Um, we're here doing that. So it's not a matter of just talking the talk. But ultimately, if we don't get support as young entrepreneurs, we don't get mentorship, we don't have an ecosystem, there are no innovation clusters that really exist for IT startups, young, small IT startups. We're fundamentally not really going anywhere. And we'll be in the same dichotomy next year and the year after and the year after. 
Um, to me, India 3.0, and I use it as a web term, is a lot about dreaming again. And this time, we've, we focus a lot in the past about dreaming for ourselves, and this time it's dreaming for our country and making sure that we put the fabric in place that will allow young companies to really move forward, because that is how you're going to get the next heartbeat. You're not going to get them by using predated old technology. And, and I think you know, that, that's a lot of the reason why we've kept a foot in India. We've made sure we launch everything here first. Otherwise, it would be of no value for me to sit on this dais uh, and, and, and give, a, give an opinion. Um, but at the same time, I know how difficult it's been here. We've spoken to almost 25 VCs across the country um, who said they did startup funding. Did they really do startup funding? Not really. They, they wanted to invest in companies that had multi-million dollar revenues already. That's not startup funding. They wanted to buy companies with net asset value, you know, uh, companies that were bel valued below net asset value from the Bombay Stock Exchange. They didn't want to invest in a startup that was trying to make social change. Um, so we were forced to look at other markets to get capital. And yet, we're still here. Um, we're still creating um, solutions that are allowing um, class B, class C CDs to get access for the idea of relevance around content. There's no point giving, it's like giving a man a fishing rod, but not teaching him how to fish. Um, and startups understand that well enough because startups are dead or they're either dead or they survive. And so they understand very quickly who's my customer, what does he want, and what do I need to do to address him. Uh, unfortunately, large enterprises take a longer time to understand that. I think, Som, you want to quickly react to that and then I will move on. Uh, a product program. We had 600 product companies there. They were all young people. I think there was excitement around. There were investors, and you're right, that there may be VCs, and there are many of them in this room, but I think there were angel funds. There were people who were funding this. We ourselves, as NASCOM, have started an innovation fund just for those startups. And I think there are all kinds of people who are coming in to now mentor, people who are working in corporates. So I'm sure you had some experiences, but I think I'm very enthused with how many no new people are coming in to do this. But I just want you to also comment on one area. You know, all the time we land up at the end blaming the government for something. I, in my role last two years, I've been meeting a lot of people in the government. If you meet them individually, they have the same passion, vision that any one of us on this dais has. And what brings them down is what Sam said, is the system. And I think we have to break that system. Just to give you an example, government organizations don't have a CIO. Right? They don't have technical people and not many want to join them. So between the government and, say, NASCOM, we formed what is known as the National Institute of Smart Governance, which helps government articulate its needs, help it bid out. The biggest problem with all the right for information and everything that we talk about corruption is the fact that procurement has become a big problem. If the government has to buy hardware, servers, uh, you know, pr routers, PCs, there's no problem. But if you have to buy a solution which can't be looking alike, then you have a problem. So I think we all have to collectively work with the government to ensure that we solve those problems because I have immense faith that all the people that I meet now have the same vision as we on this dais right now. Great. Actually, before I open the floor to questions from the audience, uh, I do want to touch upon actually some of your last point, which is you talked about the e-governance. And, um, and I think that's an important topic, which is because if you look at the World Economic Forum's uh, ranking, competitiveness ranking, I mean, India scores 83 for its technology readiness as measured by the use of innovative technology in both the public and private sector. And we all know that you know, for a society to become innovative, you can't just produce innovation, you need to be able to absorb it and adopt it as well. So um, countries like Singapore and China, of course, have spearheaded a lot of interesting e-governance projects as a way to kind of stimulate demand for uh, IT innovation. But India still scores low on e-governance, so what are the kind of steps you are going to be taking in your new role to address that? not a great admirer of a lot of these great, whether it is from World Bank or from anybody else. Because to be able to grade, you really have to understand what goes on inside the government. Our government does not publicize many of the e-governance efforts. We have e-governance activities going on for the last 25 years. We have almost 6,000 software people at NIC. Because of our complexity, cultural languages, 
numbers, you don't see progress as well as you would see in some place where there are 5 million people. So the country with 3 million people is on category 2. It doesn't make sense. We are pretty confident that we will implement many of e-governance programs, whether it is passport, driver's license, universal ID, food distribution, employment guarantee scheme plan, railway ticketing, all of these things are already in the work. Some are working, some are tested. Lot of e-governance work is already going on. I wish we could do it faster. I wish we could talk about it more often. But that's reality, right? Um, I think, Sashin, you want to react to that quickly, and then we have to go to the yeah. So um, it's a really interesting point about how we're investing in e-governance. Um, and it's not to say that we're not making the effort, but, uh, and, and I, again, I say that I'm a patriot, so I, I say this with all due respect to the people on the panel. Um, I went to get a driver's license uh, six weeks ago. Um, I saw the systems that were in place. Our IT experts, our IT companies, the leading companies of India would not export that software to Singapore, to the US, or to the UK. So why is India having to put up with it? The system was just didn't work. Let's invite some uh, questions from the audience. I think there are two hands raising there. Krishna from Oliver Wyman. Uh, I have a question over here about innovation. And just to extend to Sachin's point, all of us know that uh, innovations actually happen in startups. But reality on the ground in India is that we are a country of conglomerates. And the fundamental reason I believe uh, why we are a country of conglomerates is because of uh, bureaucracy and corruption that happens. So unless we have the money power, unless we have the networks with the government or with the politicians, it's extremely, extremely difficult to be an entrepreneur, es especially in sectors which are regulated. So if you look at the IT sector, which is probably not regulated at that point of time, we saw a huge amount of innovation happening. So the question to the panel is, unless we solve these big fundamental issues, how do we expect innovation happening in education, in healthcare, and the fundamental issues that the country is facing? Anybody want to address that? Ravi? I think the good thing about innovation is it doesn't wait for anybody else to make it happen. I think we are talking too much about government while we are talking about innovation. I think we are forgetting the fact that this is a young country, bubbling country, energetic country, and people do and will find their ways of innovating, whether there is a government support or not. I believe that you know it would be very useful to have a good educational system, but I can tell you even now with whatever education system that we have, when we go and talk to colleges, their third year and fourth year students come out with brilliant ideas. We run programs for colleges for young innovators, and there is a phenomenal response. And those people are not telling us that the government is not promoting innovation. They're telling us that here is an idea and I can go out and do it. I think we are discounting the fact that we, have a we are a young country, we are taught to think in a different way, and we can come out with a lot of innovations. I would, I would think that this is a great place and a great time to have an innovative society. I think irrespective of what anybody else does, over the next five years, you will see a lot of innovations coming out of India. I really believe so, because I'm seeing it in colleges today when we deal with colleges. I think everybody wants to react. I think Sam, you want to go first, and then yeah, yeah. it happens at the edge and not at the core. I think it's important to understand that. All innovations happen at the edge. Hardly anything happens at the core. Government operates at the core, not at the edge. Hari and then Sachin. Yeah. You know, uh, if you are a real entrepreneur, you don't really complain about the government. And any constraint is, to me, an opportunity. Uh, you know, we have many social entrepreneurs here who have done amazing stuff. Yesterday there was an award for that. And you should see the kind of things that we do in the regulated industry. In the healthcare, you see innovation. You see centers of excellence. People have done amazing things, brought the delivery cost down to, I heard, to 1,200 rupees. So if you, if you have an idea, if you have the passion, uh, don't complain. I, my suggestion is don't complain go work and find a way to get it done. Because if you keep complaining, it will never happen. Question? So I think it's 
with due respect, it's not about complaining. Um, it's about volume. Um, we produce innovation, no one denies that. We embrace startups in a certain manner, no one denies that either. But have we looked at the volume of innovation that we lose out on? Have we looked at the volume of engineering talent that goes to the US, to Europe, to Singapore, to go set up their startup? Because it's just fundamentally too difficult to work here. Why is it that the Singapore government has clusters where they embrace with startup companies and say, hey, come help us with e-governance? In fact, as an Indian company, we were asked to help do the grid computing consortium in Singapore. We had our own, yet within India, we just couldn't find the people to talk to. And it's not us. I mean, any, anyone I speak to in the startup world has the same issue. Singapore. Today, Singapore is looking at India for pharmaceutical innovation. There is no hardcore innovation on pharmaceutical side in Singapore. They need external factors to help them innovate. So I, I, I don't agree with that. You know, so if you, if you really see, there are so many, if you take life science, let's take life science as an example. You'll find startups from in universities today. You find startup, small companies doing interesting stuff in even in biopharmaceutical, a scientist comes out. If you see the whole of Hyderabad, all these large companies today you see, they, were, they came out of one company, IDPL. Employees from IDPL today are running conglomerates. That's what entrepreneurship is. And the, those clusters are starting to happen. So, and you will see it everywhere. Go to Bangalore, you'll find youngsters doing amazing stuff. So, you know, we can complain about everything, but I think we, we need to move ahead and go and get things done. So it's, it's not about you this, know, that this is the country of diversity, disparity, contradictions, confusion, and you got to accept all that. That's India. <laughs> if you're not willing to accept that, you can't go forward. Look at it this way. There are 300 million illiterate. Similarly, there are probably 300 million below poverty line. Roads don't work. Power fails. The day you fix all these things, first I got to fix literacy, female literacy, then infant mortality, then 15 other things before I come to entrepreneurs and innovations and give them all the venture capital they need and all that. But it will happen. The day all of these problems get sorted out, you will cease to be a developing society. Until then, you got to go through this journey. There are no shortcuts. Just enjoy it while you're going. I understand that. No, no, I understand that. That's what I'm saying. So you got to accept it. It's OK. It's OK. I think the platform before, I think the conversations in a platform like this has changed. I think the aspirations of the country have changed. And I think that itself is going to be a driver. And I guess people like you who would provoke things here, right, would also ensure that the speed of that change happens. And I think the, uh, when you were at 3% growth rate and so on, there was nothing to aspire for. I kept writing those essays in school, India of my 80s, and my children just utter writing India in 90s. Nothing happened, right? But I think this time, I think we have a chance to rewrite. Yeah. Let's uh, invite another question. Someone maybe from that side. My name is Keel Premchand. I have a base in Switzerland as well as here, so I have a comment, a submission to the panel. I think that we have a habit on these panels of focusing on IT, but Indian industry goes well beyond IT. Uh, one of our businesses in India has innovated to survive. It's now learning to use that innovation to go beyond the shores of India. And we have a portfolio of 43 patents. Uh, and this portfolio of patents is something that we've had to create using our knowledge base, our power of lateral thinking, and for example, you will refer in the preamble to the space rockets, uh, the Agni would not be able to take off without an innovative invention that we've provided to Israel. So I think that we have to learn to stop complaining and to start doing, and we are very small, very low key, we just get on with it. And I think that that's a message that perhaps could be propagated through a, a panel like this. Thank you. One last question, maybe from that side. Hi, I'm Asha Jadeja from Palo Alto, California. Uh, wanted to address um, a concern raised by uh, Sachin Rubal. 
about lack of, uh, about sort of venture capitalist funds here being, uh, being extremely large, and wanting somebody to have revenues of over, you know, eight, ten million dollars or something. Uh, I just want to, you know, point out to you that um, this similar sort of a dynamic existed in the U.S., in the Silicon Valley, about 10 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago. And if you remember the examples of uh, Jungli, Yahoo, and Google, what happened was that some of us angel types actually got in first. And then came the venture capitalists, and they lost out big time. That, what, that's what motivated the venture capitalist industry in the Silicon Valley to start investing, to actually compete with the angels and invest smaller amounts at complete risk without having companies incorporated. We did not have any, we didn't even, people didn't even have a business plan when some of these companies were made. And I'm seeing for the first time in the last three years a, a steady trickle of angels coming from Silicon Valley, maybe even local angels, I'm sure. And once that happens, and once they get into some of the good deals, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely confident that the venture capital industry is going to start investing smaller amounts. Uh, and I'm hoping to take the lead on that, and I will give you my card before I go. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, quick comment, then you have to wrap up. So, uh, there's a gentleman here, Martin Hemming, uh, who would probably be the, the person that uh, who would be able to pass on a lot of data. But from a lot of the VCs that we've spoken to, the definition of Series A in India is just different to the rest of the world. The definition of angel in India, if you don't know the person, it's just not accessible. The idea is no one's complaining. Uh, please, please don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is it's not perfect. And that's not to say that it has to be perfect tomorrow. But until we realize we have an issue, we're not going to solve it. Why let it do what we do with everything else, let it become a problem, and then we try and solve it? Why can't we solve it at an issue stage? So actually what I'd like to do is stop complaining and actually no end on a, I guess, optimistic note. So what I'd like to actually do is actually invite each of you to provide like a, you know, one or two kind of maybe quick kind of uh, statement on how you see, you know, India's innovation potential actually playing out in the next, you know, two decades or so. Maybe Harry, you want to start very briefly? You know, I, uh, I see uh, that the confidence is starting to build. looking at not only incremental in innovation, but breakthrough innovation. The only thing uh, on the point of the government that I would like to add finally is when, we, when it comes to early stage science, that means a science much before it can be closer to commerciality is, should be policy driven. That means uh, like NIS which grants early stage science in universities and Indian government, let me say, has the grant level has been, I believe, increased 10 times. And I think this needs to go 100 times, just to build early stage science in the universities and the research infrastructure on which entrepreneurs will translate and build commercial sector. Hmm. Great, Sam? We are living in very exciting times in India. One with potential for eight to 10% growth, young population, fair amount of technology in terms of IT, mobility, genetics, biotech, nanotech, material, further liberalization, stable government, understanding of the government to further liberalize and focus on development, and real only place in the world to address unique, complicated, large problems of the world. That's the romance you have in India. Sam? Two decades, that's too long. I, I think we have to do it in the next five years and make a huge beginning. We have all the ingredients with us, right? You have a prime minister who's an economist. I'm not sure how many countries have that. And I, I think this is the time to change all those aspirations, channelize both your anger and your passion, right, more directly. And I hope people like Sam would be able to influence the government to get some accountability and time to do it. Because we have the money, we have the resources, we have the capabilities, but we just cannot keep pushing projects and accept that they will get delayed. Sam, sorry. Remember, building a nation is very different from building a company. You can build a company in five years. You cannot build a nation in five years. So when we talk of India, we are talking about building a nation. It's a long process takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, and especially democratic nation. So you have to accept that. 
Ravi Ravi and then Sashin. So I think uh, these are, I will almost echo Sam's words, uh, these are exciting times. Uh, these are the times where uh, what I call as green growth is going to happen. And when I say green, I mean sustainability in every point of view, from every perspective. We heard our prime minister talk about inclusive growth. To me, that's a part of green growth. So we are going to see green as well as growth, and that's going to happen in India. I believe that we will come out with solutions which can be used in India as well as abroad. And these are just fantastic times to be here. Sashin? So I, I can't really add much to what the distinguished panel has said, but in our lifetime, we see moments of inspiration, creativity, and greatness. As individuals, these remain moments. As a united population, it becomes a paradigm shift. This paradigm shift starts today. It's about a better tomorrow, not a glorious yesterday. The most thing, important thing for me is India 3.0 needs to be about dreaming again. It needs to be about giving leverage to our country, a great nation, where diversity is a core part of our DNA. So we sit at a very important crossroads. Do we innovate for the world or do we innovate for ourselves? And more importantly, do we dream for ourselves or do we dream for her? And that's what I really like everyone to go away with. Great. Thank you so much. So um, I guess what happens often is we start a topic like innovations and then we all disband and we kind of forget about it. So we wanted to kind of change the format a little bit here. So we are going to officially close here the session, of course. But the hope is that we'll continue the discussion we started here even after the summit is over. To that effect, I'm very pleased to announce that the Center for India and Global Business is launching today a dedicated website called, surprise, innovations.net. That's innovations in plural dot net which is going to be a social networking site where we intend to showcase the amazing innovations happening in India across the board and invite the entire world to discover and interact with Indian entrepreneurs and corporations driving these innovations. So I invite you warmly to join our discussion on innovations.net. Meanwhile, please join me in thanking our panelists for their stellar contribution. <laughs>